man-to-man, one-on-one coverage because the safety rolls to Jefferson's side. This guy's like becoming like a circus act. Like he could, <laughs> he could do, he could do this. Von Rock caught a ball with his thighs. We didn't nah, even talk about that. It was more of with his ass. If he throws a good ball, this is a running, catching touchdown untouched. Right. Become who we want to be as individuals, and at the end of the day, that's how it's be a successful offense. Like, the KP does like these flips after every win. And I'm like just waiting for him to do his flips. You can tune in anywhere that you guys follow us on social media. Shout out to Jalen Ramsey. He sucks. <laughs> Welcome to the Practice Squad Podcast. My name is John. I'm jo- joined by my co-host Mark. And Jeff Okuda just got traded today. So, you know, as a Lions fan, I think that's kind of like what we want to maybe start this episode off with. Um, Current events, man. OBJ signing with the Ravens. OBJ kind of a... Good- Unexpected busy week. About. Yeah, it was stuff. Um, the Masters. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of a lot of important stuff to talk about. Yeah, we are going through and uh, a lot more. You know, newsworthy than I was expecting it to be. I guess like two weeks before the draft or whatever. It usually starts to quiet. Yeah, down. Draft is coming up. Yeah, man. Two weeks away. Two weeks away. So uh, very very excited for that. So uh, look, let's talk about the thing that I'm most ignorant on because I unfortunately had a busy weekend and did not get to see a ton of it. But the Masters. Um, I do know that there was a lot of weather adverse, uh, you know, problems that they weird, had to kind of overcome, weird right? kind of, you know, roller coaster of weather. Uh, they had a tree blow over. Or, or, or I was looking at, um, they were talking with Scott Van Pelt, who covers the Masters, and he said it wasn't even that windy. Like, he thinks that, I mean, obviously some of those trees are put there, and he said that it might have just fallen over because of a lack of, you know, when they put the tree in, it Support. wasn't like naturally grown there. Right. And so they had, he said they had the tree replaced though in like 30 minutes because the grounds team at the masters is just like, they have resources. Like, where do you get a tree that size fully grown, you know, to just put I mean, it back? It's there. like what? It's like private jets. It's like heated oh, greens. Dude, the and masters is like one of the like... hardest. It's like one of the most exclusive clubs and like events to be included. I, I, going to the Masters, honestly, I was talking to my dad about this. I was like, I think I would rather go to the Masters than be at a Super Bowl. Like, I think that the Masters is like one of the like Masters Sunday is, and I, you know, I think it's the best Sunday, maybe besides the Super Bowl in sports. You know, there's just something about it. It's it it just always seems to be a special day. You know, beautiful weather, even when it was shitty weather the first few days. Of course, right. Sunday's going to come around. Um, but John Rahm, man, John Rahm, I know you didn't watch a lot of it, John. I, I, I placed a, two future bets before the Masters started. Okay. So on Wednesday night, I placed two bets. I placed a small bet on Scotty Scheffler to win, which, you know, cause he won last year. And then I placed, uh, I doubled that bet and placed it on Rahm to win. And that was the only two bets I made. So the whole so weekend, you, you're feeling pretty good right now. What were, yeah. What were, well, uh, Rahm's when he, odds? He, it was like, I think I did like 10 to win like 130, something like that. So, I mean, he was, he wasn't the favorite, but he was up there. I just had a good feeling about his style of play. Um, and I, it didn't look good when he four putted the, you know, the first hole. Um, I was like, oh, you know, shitty bet. And then he just kind of turned it around. He's got an interesting story. Obviously this tweet that John pulled up, he posted, I think back in like 2013 or something. 2013. Yeah. And, and obviously just calling his shot saying, you know, you, one day you're going to have to win. I, it was interesting, John, because I'm going to connect this with the UFC fight. Did you watch the Adesanya fight? Uh, uh did yes. you see the knockout? No, so, yeah, I did see that, which by the way, like Adesanya has gone like, like my fandom of him has been like this and this, and now it's like coming back up kind of with the it's UFC, like, you know, they're, cause they're su- sometimes they can be such polarizing athletes, right? Because either you hate right. them or you love them. You know, McGregor was so good at doing that. And I think he's starting to find his ability to kind of get people to either hate him or love him, which is in the UFC, Honestly, the best thing you can have. I love his personality. I mean, the fact that he's a weeb, he kind of reminds me of Jamal Williams, like in that regard, the thing that annoys me. And we, we kind of covered this, what a couple of weeks ago, uh, he's, he's clearly using steroids and he's lying about it. And I know you can't like truth about it. Yeah, That's I the mean, part that bothers me, but if like, you can't prove it. You can't prove it. But I, I wanted to connect this tweet from Rom right? Because he won the Masters Sunday. Obviously, Adesanya won his his fight. And what he said, I don't, did you see his speech after he won? He kind of took the mic from Rogan and he was like, listen, if you, if you don't ever, none of you will feel this happiness, this moment, if you don't chase something that you don't, pe- other people don't think you'll ever get. 
right? right? Or something. If you don't have something out there that isn't easily attainable for you, you'll never have the feeling of I got it or I did it. And he said, well, it feels that's the so one good. dude that he struggled to beat his entire career. Yeah. I don't, I don't yeah. He's, he I lost he was... twice in kickboxing and once in UFC against right. him. So, um, right. yeah, I mean, talk about mountaintop. I mean, he had to be feeling the high of his life overcoming, you know, that adversity there and, and beating him. So that's, that's awesome. Same thing goes with Rom, right? Calling a shot. He believed in himself in 2013. So I think that's just cool to see two people that, um, won at the highest level in their pers- in respective sport with the same mentality. And it's the stuff you don't see. You see, everyone sees them succeed whenever they make it right. Everyone sees right. that, but it's the stuff you don't see that I think both athletes highlighted, right. And they're kind of um, when they were speaking after they won, John Rahm said the same stuff. Like he's worked because he, he, John Rahm, I don't know if you saw, has a, he has a shorter backswing, John, right. Kind of like, right. you know, yeah. more like people were saying that, golfers. Like it was, yeah. yeah. He doesn't look like he's got a full swing, but he still gets the power behind it. And it's because of uh, he had a, uh, disability was born his foot was like upside down so they had to like right. surgically break every bone in his foot and like over time as a baby so his his legs actually slightly shorter than the other leg and he doesn't have as much mobility in that ankle which is why he can't like fully rotate all the way back like you see all these other pro golfers do and the fact right. that he's overcome that is another just I love that. crazy bit about him but i, yeah, I happened to a work awesome. meeting today and and uh one of the guys that i work with he goes kind of looked like the guy that just won the masters i was like all right i'll take that as a compliment he's like got a he has a a big beard just like you (laughs) um so definitely stoked about that super interesting stuff um and then you know we can kind of move on here to okay actually i'm gonna do this in in a slightly different order i apologize oh john one more thing about the fight one more thing yeah yeah, yeah. where where do you rank that celebration because there was two celebrations there was the arrows right into him right after knocking him out which was insane the fact that he that he went into that like right after he knocked him out and then him taunting his kid doing because remember (laughs) that did you see his kid taunted him when he was like five years old right back when he lost to him the first time and then he saw the kid pointed at him in the crowd now the kid's like 10 years old and he did it again but to the kid i mean that's got to go up there with like the most Oh, UFC. Like, well, every single one of his celebrations are absolutely legendary because like there was one where, um, uh, you know, again, he's a big anime guy. Like he walks out and he writes a dude's name in the death note. <laughs> Dude, I mean, that's gotta note? be that, that. I just thought that was like up there with some of the best celebrations I've yeah. ever seen. He's, he's electric man. And you know, the cool part too, is everybody's kind of been calling him like a more boring conservative fighter, like just trying to hang on to his belt. Cause you know, like a lot of these champions, like they just, they're, they're going to get the judges on their side. So they just got to take it all the way and they're good to go. Um, but it, you know, I think he shut a lot of those haters up too by obviously knocking the dude out. So all, all around, super cool. Um, now moving on to you know, again, Lions podcast. We're we're going to be talking about this stuff at length. Football like, first podcast, but and we football do like, first. We do podcast. love other things too. We do, but I'm also saying you know just the fact like this this needs its time of day because I actually have a lot of thoughts about it. Um, I think this was a great move personally. I'm bummed that Akuda is not going to get his opportunity uh, to, you know, kind of prove himself in Detroit. I don't think he's a bust. I actually think he's probably still has a pretty good career ahead of him. Um, I think he's going to be able to overcome the injury and the adversity and all that stuff later in his career. I think he's a good tackle tackler. Um, and I think he has the right mindset to be successful in the NFL. So it is a bummer that's not happening with the Lions. With that being said, I think that us moving on, gaining about $6 million in cap space going into this season. And then um, obviously not having to pay him for next season. Um, And then on top of the fact that, you know, we did get a fifth rounder out of it and people are saying, Oh, well, you know, all you got was the fifth rounder out of it. Have you guys seen what Brad Holmes does with late round draft picks? I'm fine with it. Get any draft pick. I'm cool. Like this is fine. Well, I, I, and Um, I understand why people might be upset saying, well, we picked him third overall and right. only a few years later, you you know, you only get a fifth round pick for him. The reality is better than nothing. He's better than, he's better than nothing. And, and he's worth a, and he's worth a fifth round pick right now. I think I don't yeah. think he's because, you know, when you say he's not a bust, he's a bust in my eyes because and it's not his fault. He was drafted at third overall. 
So the expectations in your draft at third overall is to is to you're a superstar. You're going to be Sauce Gardner. franchise. You're a superstar. They expect you to be exactly Sauce Gardner, Deion Sanders, Jalen Ramsey. They expect you to be when you're drafted. I, I hated it, but you know, it's I, I wouldn't put it on him. I think he will have a fine career. He will never live up to the expectations of being drafted third overall. It's not on him as the Lions doing a good move. But I love getting rid of him. Obviously, it brings the question, John, and it's a little preview, I guess, into what we'll talk about, the draft move that you wanted to talk about. Witherspoon at six is being rumored to happen. I think this kind of shores up that rumor as a, as a very strong possibility. But go ahead and talk about what you think is going to happen because of yeah, this. Yeah, so you posted your TikTok, and I'm inclined to agree with you. I don't think a cornerback is, you know, uh a guy that you select at six overall, especially with how deep this edge rusher class is. I say you go get one of those guys opposite side of, of Aiden Hutchinson. That just is the better move. So my thought is everybody's talking about trading up, you know, from six to three to go get that edge rusher. And now they're talking about staying put at six and drafting Witherspoon. I personally love Witherspoon. I think he's a great player. I think he'd make a phenomenal lion. I do not think he is a six overall pick for the same reasons you're uh, referencing to Akuda. So I think what's more likely now is that we actually take 18 and try to trade up into, you know, maybe say like the 14 to 10 range to grab Witherspoon. Um, maybe we have to go a little higher to make sure that we get him. I'm not sure. Um, I'm sure this is going to be like a draft day thing, right? Kind of like what we did with JMO where Holmes knew who we wanted to trade with. And he said, I will trade with you. We have our agreement in place. As long as my guy is there when the pick rolls around and the pick. Rolls and I'll be honest with down. you, John, I think I, you know, you're, I don't think that that's um, out of the possibility of happening. I, I think there's a chance that Witherspoon's there at 18. I think there's a chance we don't move either pick and we take best available at six, which is not going to be Witherspoon. And he might still be there at 18. I just don't think, the value, you know, it's not, he's just not a superstar like Jalen Ramsey level player to draft in those first like 15 picks. I just, yeah, he but might be taken, I, but he has lion written all over him with the way that he tackles, the way that he plays with his mentality. Like, I just think he's a really great fit for this team. So again, this is nothing against Witherspoon saying we don't want him at six. We just need to learn from our prior mistakes from previous yeah, administrations you can't take that you don't six. take corners that high. Especially you can't take any corner. You can't take any corner in this draft. I mean, he, literally, if you're going to take a guy that high, it has to be a guaranteed lock, like franchise level player that's going to play for you for 15 years. Like you just can't, you can't take a corner that high. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. Now to follow up this Okuda situation, we now have, and free cap space about $20 million to work with, which is a lot of freaking money, right? We have we have damn near $30 million to work with um in general cap space, but you know, we're gonna have a pretty big rookie class. It's gonna cost about eight to nine million to sign all those guys. So Mark and I have also made a TikTok about this and have to have a conversation about this. We have a problem at linebacker. We are lacking athletic linebackers that can kind of drop back in coverage, kind of be that versatile, super speedy guy that we're looking for. Um, and we're probably going to try to address that in the draft, but obviously there's question marks that come with whatever guy you draft. So with the $20 million in cap space that we have, maybe we can look to sign uh, Devin White to you know, either a one-year contract because we know uh, Holmes loves those prove-it deals or maybe a long-term, you know, three, four-year contract um, for us. I think that it would be a great move. I think he would plug up um, probably our biggest weak spot on defense. Um, and I don't think, I think we have the cap space for it. And who the hell else are we going to spend, you know, 10, 15, $20 million on this late in the free agency at this point? John, I'll put it this way. Um, you, We should do in Detroit, whatever we need to do to get this dude signed. And it does not just need to be a, he's already proven it. So the prove it deal, this dude's proven he can play. Okay. And stud. <laughs> in terms of all linebackers in the league right now, if I could name one that is the best fit for the Detroit lions right now, it's him. He's one of the most athletic dudes can run side to side, can cover, can do anything you ask him to do. And if you haven't noticed, the linebacker position is changing every single year. You have to be just an absolute freak athlete, right? The Fred Warners, the Bobby Wagners, right? Those guys, all right, Demario Davis, like those guys, the best of the best are freaks. And 
Devin White is right there with those guys. And when he was playing with the Bucks defense that had, um, you know, the pieces around him, they were really tough to move the ball on. I mean, they shut Patrick Mahomes down in the Super Bowl. So he's the guy. He saves your defense. He becomes the the engine of your defense. You mix that with what we're going to draft with Aiden Hutchinson in year two with a way better secondary behind him. And, I mean, you're looking at one of the best defenses in the league, dude. You really are. I'm, I'm he not changes kidding. you that much. I know. And I'm not kidding when I say this too. Like I've, you know, I've been telling Lions fans to slow down a little bit when they start throwing out, you know, the, the SB word a little bit in reference to this next season. I think, okay, let's win the division and make the playoffs. That's a huge win for this season. This honestly, this changes makes me kind of comfortable dude. saying we're a contender. Like it really does. He's that so, good. And, and it's not just that he's that good. It's the fit that he brings to Detroit, to the guys we already have on our roster, to yep. who we probably are looking to draft, to our philosophy, right? Like, he, he's young. He's still young. Um, He's just – he's a perfect fit. He's the best fit at the linebacker position. He's exactly what we've been talking about this entire offseason of what's the thing we're missing? That, you know, because yep. Anzalone is the opposite of that. He's older. He's slower. He doesn't move laterally as well. Can't cover as well. Right. Devin White solves all those problems. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And again, who the hell else are you spending, you know, the amount of cap space that we he's have? He's worth it, man. Yeah, I mean, he's like, worth it. Like, that's why left? you have this cap. Like, you always say, don't swing and miss on, you know, Brad Holmes. You, you've you always respected Brad Holmes for not doing that, right? Swinging on, or, you know, or overpaying guys and chasing stars. This is one of those times where you have a team that's kind of built on lower key players that are more affordable on prove-it deals. You do need stars to win games, though. Yeah, dude. Go, you go don't have a ton of stars, like, so you know, go get him. Three years, thirty million dollars. Yeah. right. Like go get nothing him. super yeah. crazy. He's a linebacker at the end of the day. That he wants that's, out. They don't. He break wants the out bank. of Tampa. You exactly. Know? He, Let's make it happen. Um, and then I think this is worth talking about too. So the reason why is because going into the season, Mark said Aiden Hutchinson to me needs to be comparable to a Bosa for him to kind of pan out in my in my head is you know being worth the number two overall pick and so i take a look at this he obviously is you know the most pressures of the season which is notable and he flirts with joey bosa which i'm i'm stoked about and you know you take a look at the other guys in this list you know way more pressures than chase young uh you know in the same genres as uh bradley chubb and lawson uh more than williams more than khalil mack um more than short who i'm not familiar with that guy um personally but i do have to know there is a guy in a league of his own entirely different class than everybody else here and that's nick bosa yeah again like you know i know that you weren't trying to say like oh aiden hutchinson needs to be god in order to not be a bust but it's this jumped out at me when i saw that where i was like wow nick bosa really had like no one's even close to him. The amount of pressures that he had in his rookie year. That's insane, dude. Yeah. I, I mean, mean, it really goes to show how to be, That's an impressive list to be on and to have the, you know, number Hutchinson has in comparison to those guys. The, the, I think the biggest thing though is take the step forward, right? You know, right. don't be, don't be, okay what are you going to do here too? Look here. Cause if yep. he doesn't, you know, he's got to develop more. I still expect more out of him. Um, totally. Than what we saw, well, right? Cause there was times me, that he messed up. He was making mistakes. There was times he was really good. But we got right. to see the consistency um, throughout to me, the entire season. You get a Jalen Carter or a Will Anderson or even a Tyree Wilson, and he doesn't have so much double team pressure on him. It's an entirely different conversation. I've been saying this, you know, pretty much since the season ended is that all we need is this guy needs help on the other side of the defensive line or on the interior. You know, there's an interior pass rush of some sort. I, I think it completely changes the game for what he's allowed to do as a as an edge rusher so um excited about that uh obviously you know he, he had a really promising year you know four turnovers almost 10 sacks like da damn good rookie year let's see if we can top it um this one is just a short one that i think is funny it's april and the rams do not have a single specialist on their rock their roster which is like, who are they, are they going to draft these guys? I don't think uh, so. Probably they don't have sign, any draft capital to work with. They're going to sign probably bums. just sign some dudes from off the street, you know, yeah. like, but that some is dudes uh, hanging out outside of SoFi. You're like, hey, you want to play? I mean, I don't know what's going on in LA, dude. I really don't know because, 
you know, they lost Baker. Uh, they lost OBJ now in free agency. They traded Ramsey. I'm not sure. The the LA Rams are the dot com bubble of NFL football teams. Like they went from this to like pure ascent to Super Bowl team to just the hardest, most painful crash down in a super short amount of time that you could possibly witness for an NFL team. Um, I, I, it's wild to me. I don't know how they're going to recover from this. I actually think it's going to take years for them to be able to get to a point where they even have the draft capital to go and find guys to make themselves like a 500 team again. Like it's rough. And I think it's it's a good cautionary tale for, you know, the way the Rams built their team versus the way that, say, the Eagles or the Lions or the Jaguars built their teams, right? Where yeah. the draft capital was important. They took patient. the risk and they, yep. it, it worked out, but uh, it fell they, apart rather quickly. It's because you build your team that way, you know, you might succeed, you might not, but one thing's for sure, you're going to have a downfall. Yeah. Very quickly after. It's wild. Um, other notable news, obviously, uh, Odell Beckham Jr. signing with the Ravens for a uh, talk about overpayment. I mean, $15 this million dollars seems, guaranteed. Dude, here's a, like OBJ at this point in his career. I mean, there's a lot of question marks. He's coming off of an ACL injury. He's, you know, getting older. Um, he's not a number one receiver. I don't think. No. And they just paid him like he is a number one receiver. And it, I, to me, it Not only a number like a, one, a top 10 receiver. I mean, 15 no, yeah, million in one year is ridiculous. It's ridiculous, dude. But he's not even a primary receiver, though, I'm saying, like on any mm -hmm. any team you put him on, right? And in Baltimore, they're going to ask him to be. Um, this just seems like an act of desperation to me. I, I, I really feel an like... An act of desperation to keep Lamar around, but you just ate into the amount of money that you can pay Lamar in the process. So, I... Weird. I just... It's I weird. think they truly feel like Lamar's going to sit out, and this was their, like you know, Hey, we're going to get you a guy. And it's like, okay, cool. You overpaid for a guy who is kind of, um, you know, he's an entertainment factor. He's definitely going to bring a lot of eyes on this team. People love watching him play. He's a big play, um, explosive guy. He's a great teammate from what I understand. Obviously things went wrong with the Browns, but like it, other players, well, things went wrong with the giants them. too. You know, there's clearly something with, and I'm not saying OBJ is a bad teammate. I'm just saying that, um, He's kind of a prima donna. And if things don't mm -hmm. go his way and things aren't going smoothly, uh, he can become a problem, not only for the team, but for himself. So you mix that with, and I don't know, dude, like, again, Lamar is not the greatest passer in the world. Okay. He's, he's going to be coming from Matthew Stafford, who I would, as a receiver, I'd much rather have Stafford throwing me the ball than Lamar. Uh, the Ravens are a run heavy run first team. So OBJ is not going to get a ton of looks. You know, their primary guy they like to throw to is Mark Andrews, he's a tight end. Right. So, you it's, know, how it's is he going to handle situation. getting three targets? We saw, I mean, you, we saw how upset he got in, you know, New York and Cleveland when he didn't get the ball or when he didn't get looks or when a yeah. quarterback overthrows him. Listen, Lamar misses guys. You know, he's not the most accurate passer in the world. And he's kind of a run, you know, he's going to want to run the ball. Um, if he, And that's if he even plays. Can you imagine if he doesn't play, how OB, OBJ is going to react? Yeah, it's it's a very very weird situation. I think what this does is he Lamar is not going to sit this next year, but I sure as hell don't think he's going to get traded at this point. So it's the entire situation is bizarre for sure. Odell obviously is just going there for the money. That's fine. Like not not go get your bag, dude. Nothing wrong with that. From the Ravens front office standpoint, I just don't totally understand the move. I think, like you said, it's a pure act of desperation. Yeah. So, um. Last thing on our current events before we get to our draft prospecting, and I'm sorry to do Yikes. it to the man. I'm I, so look. I wasn't going to talk about this. I kind of have to because the entire internet talked about. The entire internet had the same reaction that I did when I saw. This How can picture. you not? Was holy shit, dude! You are my age, and your hairline is looking brutal. Super. Now it looks good with a hat on, so I'll give him credit. And probably why he wears one all the time. But like, dude, you just gotta shave that shit. Like, it's fine. It's not that big of a deal. You'll look just fine if you have, you know, like a shaved head or whatever. So, Brock Purdy's Brock Purdy's stressing him out, dude. His hair's falling out. I mean that that wouldn't uh, with the expectations that I have on me, and then you know, Mr. Irrelevance coming up and taking my job. I I don't blame him. So, um, 
Again, Trey, so- sorry to do it to you, uh, but the internet was talking about it way too much for me <laughs> to ignore it. And uh, it was the first reaction I had when I saw the picture as well. So also Mahomes' shorts kind of don't get a lot of mention in this because of the hairline, but like anyone other than Mahomes wearing those shorts, we'd be like, what is what's good with that? Dude, he he can wear whatever he, and people he, can't. He say looks anything. like he's about to head to like, you know, a, a cookout with Andy Reid right now. Like, yeah, like I don't know what that is. You know, that's like a very light green and blue tiger stripe. Then, then he's got a, a tucked in like long athletic sleeve. hoodie. Yeah. On. I don't know. It's not it's not very good to, you know, his his curves there either. So it's is a very interesting picture to see. <laughs> a lot of, lot of questions going on with that picture. So um all right, we're going to get into draft prospecting and I personally don't feel like my performance on the offensive draft prospecting was the best um primary reason for that was I was exhausted from how much I had been working. Um, I'm feeling a lot more prepared and a lot better. About feeling good about your de- your defense. defensive scouting report here. Well, and not only that, but I, I was saying to Mark when we first started the episode, it's like, man, like offense, I was like struggling to find like that third or fourth notable guy at each position. And defense, I was struggling to figure out what names I had to leave off the list and which ones I wanted to fit in and things like that. So I just think maybe this draft class all around is a lot deeper. Um at, but, at defense and this offense with the exception of tight end i'm not sure but i have a lot i think more it's a common about. thing too i think it's a common thing to um to note that the defensive side of the ball usually that's a common thing of the position groups are usually deeper like the the difference from will anderson to the sixth or seventh best edge guy is not as much as the difference between bryce young to will levis Right, like the sure. fall or off he, happens. Or you quick. even talk about offensive tackles, right? Dude, like, exactly. Or, or even you know. any any offense position, the top of the top is way up there, and then it, it falls off rather quickly. And I'm not saying those guys are bad players. I'm just saying the top are so good offensively. And then on defense, it's like okay, the top are really good, and then there's some guys that are pretty damn close to them that might right. even be better pros. And there's some guys right behind those guys that are like, well, they do this better than him, and this better than him, and more upside here, and. So defensively, you can get away with more. Like you can take more risks in your picks. Uh, your scouting is a little bit different. Offensively, I feel like is easier to scout um, because there's just the talent's easier to see. Right. Defensively, you kind of have to look for potential and how they're going to fit into you. Defensive, it's a whole different game. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I mean, with that being said, our positions for this: we got edge rusher, interior defensive line, linebacker cornerback safety. So that's what we're going to run through here. Um, and I think Mark and I have relatively diverse lists to kind of compare. Um, there's some guys I knew that Mark was going to put on his underrated that I chose not to, because I wanted Mark to go ahead and talk about them. But uh, yeah, overall, I think this should be, you know, a pretty smooth conversation with a lot to talk about. So I'm excited here. We're going to start with edge rusher. So my list for top three are Will Anderson Tyree Wilson and Miles Murphy. My overrated, which is coming with an asterisk next to it, is Nolan Smith. I don't think he's overrated as a player. I think he's overrated as an edge rusher. I don't think he has the size in order to actually compete with a lot of tackles as an edge rusher. I think he's better suited as more of like a linebacker. He's a great run defender. He has an insane amount of speed. Uh, he's great vision for the game, but I just don't see him as like this pure edge rusher due to his size. I think he's going to get bullied by tackle. So that's why I have him as an overrated player. Great player. Don't want to talk shit on Nolan Smith as a, as a prospect in general. I just think that evaluators are going to think the same thing that I'm thinking here, which why would you take a six two Nolan Smith when you can have a six, five Will Anderson, you know, like it's a, a lot more weight to throw around, a lot more strength to throw around, et cetera. My sleeper is, uh, hopefully I don't butcher the name, Felix Andudiki Uzama. <laughs> and um, I, think you hit, I think you crushed that name. I think Andudike, you got it. I think it's Andudike Uzama. <laughs> I think you got so, it. Okay, cool. Um, and uh, he's my sleeper because of the fact, you know, uh, Washington State, I think, is where he, he was at. Um, and he's a little further on the depth chart, but he kind of has comparable size and speed. So those first three guys that I mentioned, 
if you don't get those first three guys, that's probably where I might look to, to, to you know, kind of grab somebody who has the potential to, to fill that role. So that's where I'm at for my edge rushers. How about you, Mark? It's not a bad list. Um, we will have, I guess, some some difference points here. I, I got Will, Ander- will Anderson as my number one edge rusher and my um, number one or two overall player in the draft. I think uh, he's the best available guy, period. I think he would have been the best available guy in last year's draft. That's how good he is. Um, I have Miles Murphy as my second guy. And then I have Nolan Smith as my third guy um, for actually the same reasons that John said, except positive, right? Like the size, the speed, right? I think that, like I said, you know, you mentioned maybe more of a linebacker hybrid type guy. Exactly. Right. And I think that what a team will probably do is get him and use him as like a stand up guy who can kind of, you know, defensive schemes are getting crazy, John, and they're starting to drop defensive ends. I mean, Aiden Hutchinson had interceptions this year because they're using him in coverage. They're standing him up. Yeah. They're standing him up and just dropping him back into vacated, right? They'll blitz a linebacker and have Hutchinson drop off because what? You don't expect it to happen. Right. Right. And it's hard to prepare as a quarterback, especially with these quick RPOs that teams are doing for that. So I think he actually fits into that role because he's athletic enough to do that. And I think that, um, you know, he's comparable to like a Von Miller, right? Kind of an undersized guy, edge rusher who can get home. But also if you want to drop him into coverage and and just throw fits for young quarterbacks, you can do that too. So um, I have him there for that reason, just more of the versatility. A lot of teams will look at it, like you said, as a downfall. Um, And then my overrated guy is actually Tyree Wilson, who a lot of people are high on. I just um, I just didn't see enough of him, you know, in college to say that he because people are starting to say that he's right there with Will Anderson as in terms of edge. And people are even saying that he's kind of comparable to like the Jalen Carter, Will Anderson defensive line group. I don't think he's in the same category. And that's why I have to say I'm not saying he's a bad player. Yeah, or he won't be good. I'm just saying he's way overrated. The no, fact that prospects you even are even name. saying that he might get taken over with ahead Anderson. of him. Yeah, and I just I don't agree with that at all. I think. um He's he's way too raw of a technician. He's a project, and he's you yeah. know he's definitely has the potential to be a star, right? But like you can't, he hasn't done enough to to warrant his name even remotely close to a Will Anderson, and I, that's why I have him as overrated. It's, it's the thing is, you know, people fault Anderson because he might not be as fast or as powerful as some of these guys, but Anderson is a great football player with incredible technique, and that's what separates yeah. him. Tyree Wilson, he's got the speed, he's got the strength, but like Size, he's more but... of a bull rush kind of guy. Yeah. Like he he doesn't really have the, those those technical skills just yet. He can develop into that as you're right. reading. But and then I, my I underrated my underrated guy is uh, BJ. Or I'm going to try to say it as BJ Ojoari at LSU. I think he's another one of those more more similar to like Tyree Wilson project, right? Um, I think he showed a little bit more than Tyree Wilson in of the technique and stuff like that you just mentioned. Uh, I think he's a really good prospect though. I think that he's going to kind of slip. I think in other years he may be drafted, you know, first round, but um, you know, it's a deep edge class. So I think he'll probably drop for that reason. And some team's going to be lucky to get him in a later round. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Man, I I just got to say this. It's, it is a crazy deep edge class. Like it is nuts. Um, how deep this edge class is a lot of teams I think are going to be you know more patient than they usually would be at this position usually these guys go within the first top 10 picks I can see some of these guys you know falling to late first early second round and still being massive difference makers on their team yeah so um all right uh do you want to take uh IDL to get started here I, I think we have pretty similar lists so Sure. So I start with Jalen Carter. Uh, a lot of people have him as a number one overall prospect, or at least at one point did. I think if you put a, aside all the bullshit that's happened in the offseason since they won their national championship, um, no doubt about it, he's a top three or four player in this draft. I don't think you can argue it. Uh, he's the best in, in his interior defensive line position. Um, and it's it's not by a crazy large margin, actually. I do think there's some guys that are close, but he is the best guy, and I don't think you can debate that. Um, for reasons don't really need to explain, right? You've see, we've seen him enough to know why he's the top guy. Um, and then I have Brian Breezy or Breeze or however you want to say his name on the Clemson. He's a freak, man. He's a freak. Um, really cool story. This guy has obviously uh, losing his little sister and just kind of how Clemson embraced him and how he kind of, you know, he missed some time and then was able to try to play through that. Like he's got a cool story. He's a really good player. 
Um, and, you know, technically, if you watch his film, he's probably the best technical guy, period, in the interior D line in this whole draft. I think he's much more technically sound than Jalen Carter and Mozzie Smith, who's my third guy here, um, which is why I have him second and some other guys don't have him as high, right? And then Mozzie Smith, like I just said, is my third guy, more similar to Jalen Carter in terms of how he plays, a little more raw, a little more potential, but a great prospect. Um, my underrated guy is Jacqueline Roy. Same thing, similar to like BJ Ojoari out of LSU, um, project, right? And a lot of these guys are projects, right? But they have the size, speed that you're like, it stands out on film. And you every once in a while, you see a glimpse of what they're able to do. And you're like, if we can get that to be their consistent play, we get a steal. So that's why I have him here. He's shown some of that stuff inconsistent. But if he can get that consistency there, he'll be a steal in the draft. And then my overrated guy, uh, he's a middle of the pack guy anyway. I just don't know why he's even really in the conversation at all is Jacob Slade out of Michigan State. Uh, watched him play several times over the course of his career there. Um, he's just kind of stiff to me, you know. I, he's a mm -hmm. he's a he's a good college player. He's a big, strong dude. Um, you know, he'll plug some gaps for you, but he's not really gonna do much else. You know what I mean? So that's sure. why I have him there. Um, and that's my that's my list. And, you know, th this position has its nuances too, right? Because uh, as I get into my list, I'll kind of explain it. Like, you know, you have three techniques and you have nose tackles and some guys can play both. Some guys can kind of only play one or the other, right? Jalen Carter, you can probably put him anywhere in the, and that's my number one um, no brainer, right? You can probably put him on anywhere on the interior defensive line. And this dude has the speed. He has the technique. He has the size. I mean, he can plug two gaps. He can reach over and grab somebody from the other uh, gap. He has incredible strength. He's just an athletic freak. Simple as that. I just don't but, get where the questions are coming, John, about him, dude. Like, I get there's issues off the it's field. The, it's the off-field issues. But look, man, uh, the dude's a football player. And like, watch the film. Like, did you <laughs> had, have you seen the uh, the Manning Camp broadcast at all? Sorry for the yeah. quick change. Yeah. So they'll 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 talk about and they were scouting the quarterbacks. I was watching this on NFL Network the other day. They were scouting the quarterbacks and they were talking about Bryce Young. And obviously, they mentioned that his stature is smaller and that that's kind of a hit on him in the draft and then eli goes well yeah but have you watched his tape and they were showing them watching the film like he's like there's not anything that you watch him do on film that doesn't make you love him more as a prospect. his stature is ho holding it's him like back you, or something he's like, like no and then eli and then peyton made a good point he goes well did he shrink five inches or did he play his whole college career at that height Right. And Eli goes, I think he played his whole college career at that height. And he goes, exactly. Point made. Like, it's not like he, now if, if you were 6'6 six, six and all of a sudden you're 5'10, that's a different story, right? Because that's the whole, like, you know what I mean? Right. But go ahead. That's, that I just want yeah. to throw that out there. No, no. And I, I completely agree with you. You look at Jalen Carter's tape, you can pretty much say he's the best, you know, defensive line prospect in, in this class. Anderson might be comparable just because he's safer from a personality standpoint, but, you know, yeah, he's he's unreal. So my next guy then, completely opposite direction. This is Kalijah Kansi. And the reason why I think he could be a special player is because he has the speed to actually pass rush from the interior defensive line. I don't think he's going to be this, you know, this dude that can plug gaps like crazy. He doesn't have the size. What he has is great speed and great technique. And so he's somebody that on third down, is going to be giving guards and centers a shit ton of trouble, which, you know, any quarterback knows, like, it is not fun getting pass rushed from the interior. It's very difficult. No, it's right in your face. Exactly. So, completely, I mean, not to say that Jalen Carter cannot do that, but what I'm saying is that if you're drafting Kalijah Kansi, you are not drafting this dude to be a nose tackle. You are drafting him to be a pass rusher from the interior defensive line, and I think he's really damn good at that, and he's going to be your, your third down guy for that situation. Uh, number three is uh, Saiki Ika. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Um, to me, it's like, hey, if you want a project that, you know, can do similar kind of run blocking as as Jalen Carter, where he can just plug two freaking gaps at once because he's 340 pounds, that's your guy, right? So that's why I kind of like him. Um, as far as overrated, I'm sorry to say it because I know he does have a great story and I think he's a great person, but... Uh, I don't see it with Brian Breesey on tape. I really don't. I know that it's there's issues that obviously caused that to kind of happen his his uh, past couple of years at Clemson. But 
uh, I just, I just don't think he's like a top, you know, people are projecting him in the top 10, top 15. I think he's like a second round pick personally. I don't think he's a bad player. Um, I just think that he's not going to be like this absolute superstar from the interior defensive line. And my sleeper who was going to make list, you, uh, John, I'm going to make you clip that. I'm going to make you clip that statement and I'm going to hold yeah, you to that. Cause I think he's, fine. I think he's legit. I think he's legit. All right. I mean, look, so he might be, I just, I'm not seeing it. I don't see it. Um, and then Mozzie Smith is my sleeper. And it's like, to me, just watching Michigan play all year, uh, a huge reason why that defensive line was as good as it was, was because of him. I, I think our edge rushers were very average this year. And I think the reason why they were able to be as productive as they were this season is because Mozzie was able to freaking, you know, just plug like three gaps at once and make it a living hell for guards and centers on any team on the other side of the ball. So he was like an unsung hero for that Michigan defense. He really was. Um, you didn't, it, not the type of guy whose name was mentioned very often, but definitely was having a massive impact. So that's, that's my IDL list. And honestly, I love the fact that we broke this into two positions personally. Um, I know we did with, with a uh, offensive line too, but man, like this to me, like there's just so much variety from, the positional talent, the the body shapes, the skill sets to talk about with with defensive line. So this was a blast for me personally. Yeah, it's important to separate those because it's very different skill sets. Usually, very few guys can kind of go inside and outside. Um, worth talking about both. Do you want to you want to start with linebackers before we get into the secondaries? Yeah. So pretty damn deep linebacker class overall. I would say I, I think that there's a lot of guys that are going to you know be day three guys that might end up being starters for, you know, whoever they're selected by. Um, so my number one's Jack Campbell. Obviously it's kind of between him and Drew Sanders. I think Campbell is more NFL ready. I think Sanders is going to be a stud wherever he goes as well. Sanders is my number two guy here. I just think Campbell is like, he's going to be a day one starter. He's going to be ready to go. Um, Sanders probably has the potential to kind of like learn some of those more like versatility things that add a lot of value to linebackers, like being able to, you know, um, drop back in coverage and things like that. I think Campbell's size might hold him back from, you know, kind of being that guy for whichever team selects him. But if you're just looking for a pure linebacker, incredibly football smart, very quick decision maker, and has, you know, a huge body to throw around at people like that's your guy right there. Um, kind of mixed, you know, Sanders in with that as well. So I'm just going to move on to my third guy, which is a uh, day in Henley. Um, honestly, like, I just think that overall, like, this is a pretty safe pick for whoever's grabbing him. I, th I think like he's one of those dudes that does everything all right, but nothing like great, uh, probably going to be a little bit of a project, but, uh, we'll see how that works out for him. My next guy is, uh, as my overrated guy is Noah Sewell. I think that he gets a lot of credit for, you know, essentially being in the Sewell football family. Um, but I just, again, a guy that I don't see it on tape. I, unlike uh, uh, Henley, I think he's a guy that does, you know, nothing totally right. Um, hold up. We lost Mark there for a second. So I'm going to kick him and then hopefully he'll be back with us in a moment. Um, I'm just going to kind of continue my spiel here. Um as far as uh, Sewell goes, I think he's, unlike Henley, one of the guys that actually, like, doesn't do anything really to that that level that you kind of hope he does. I don't think he's the best in run defense. I don't think he's the best pass defender. Um, I just think that overall he's overrated, and honestly, I'd be surprised to see him go, you know, where he's projected in, like, the second round or something like that. Um, then my sleeper is Ivan Pace. I think Ivan Pace... Uh, doesn't get talked about enough because of his size, but I think he's a really pure linebacker that can do a lot. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, and hopefully Mark gets in here soon. So I don't have to spend too much time editing stuff tonight. Let's go. All right. Sick. I actually just kept on rambling and we missed you for about three seconds. So we might be able to avoid having to like clip anything. <laughs> we'll see. That's fine. Um, so 
TLDR, uh, I said Sewell is overrated because of the fact that unlike Henley, he can't really do anything all that great. And I, my sleeper is Ivan Pace because I think he gets knocked for his size. And I think he's a damn good football player that's going to be able to make tackles and do whatever you need him to do. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my, that is my list. And uh, apologize for the like five seconds of awkwardness there, viewers. But um, yeah, I think I think we made it through there pretty well. But you, you cut out what? Were you able to? Were you able to? Yeah, I heard my... most of it. I heard okay, most of yeah. it. I cut out like right as you got into your, you know, underrated, overrated, sure. Perfect. you know. Um, but my list is not terribly different than you, Jack Campbell. I just want to put it out there, Jack Campbell. Like he does not look like the modern day linebacker. He looks like the early two thousands linebacker. He looks yep. like the Ray Lewis build, right? Yeah, he is an AJ absolute Hawk. badass. Badass, dude. Yeah. If you have a badass linebacker like that, changes your defense. He doesn't care. He's trying to kill everybody on the other, and, and he's yep. incredibly smart. And he's, you know, he does everything well as a linebacker. He's a perfect linebacker, which you look for. I, I want to see how he covers and stuff with the athletic athleticism and speed some of these running backs and tight ends have in the league. That's my only worry with him. But he's Same. an absolute stud. He's a badass. He's a he's a great guy to have and draft. Uh, I have Pace as my second guy for the reasons that you just said um, one of those side to side can do everything athletic enough to just make, uh, you know, the offense's life hell. Uh, Cause he can take a lot of your game plan right out. And then I have Noah Sewell for the same reasons, actually, as Ivan pace can kind of go all over the place um, relation here to Penny Sewell, our boy in uh, Detroit, younger brother. So obviously pretty strong name, pretty strong record for what his brother is doing playing different position, but the mentality is the same, you know, come from the same blood. So uh, I expect him to be very, very good in the NFL as well. Uh, my underrated pick is Troy Brown. Okay. My former teammate, uh, he's coming out of Ole Miss. He grad transferred there from central Michigan. Uh, when I tell you that Troy Brown's a freak of nature, he's a freak of nature. He's an athletic freak. of I, nature. I've seen the tape. He's a stud. For he's sure. a stud. Uh, he's, you know, first team all Mac, I think three times. Um, this is a guy that came into central, by the way, as a safety. So he has that athleticism. He was a receiver safety when he came in. Um, so he has that kind of athleticism, jumping ability, hands, all that stuff. And then you, he put on weight, put on muscle and kept the speed, kept the jumping. And now he's playing linebacker. So he's a perfect hybrid guy. He can play nickel probably if you need him to, he could play safety at sometimes if you need him to, but he's going to be a legitimate outside backer. Um, and some team's going to get him late in the draft and, it's a steal. I, w I want the Lions to go and get him because he's a perfect fit for what he, we're missing. He has the skill set. And yeah. I mean, you know, potentially if we sign White, right, has a perfect role model to develop under. Um, exactly. And, and, we'll he's be ready a, to and you can get him late. You know, hey, right. with that fifth round pick we just got from Okuda, totally. sounds right to me. Um, and then my overrated guy is actually Henley. And uh, I know that you were you were high on this guy, but um, I just, again, I haven't seen enough out of him. You know, if you're going to talk about a guy – getting taken as high as he's being talked about getting taken. I just need to see more in your college film. I need to see, I need to see you stand out more in every game you play. It's and, almost uh, like we have the, the same opinions on Henley and Sewell, but reversed, right? Yeah. Like you were like, Eric, Oh, he can do everything. All right. You know, and, and I, we're talking about different guys and then we're saying, Oh, he doesn't really do anything special. We're talking about yeah. the, the different guys. I, so. And he's a good prospect. I, I'm just saying, you know, when you talk about overrated, I, you know, and I'm not, I'm not saying he shouldn't be drafted or any, anything like that. Right. I'm just saying he shouldn't be as drafted as high as people are projecting him to get taken. That's yeah. all I and that's, and, I mean and that's worth getting a point across too, which I think we've tried to say it. When we say these guys are overrated, it doesn't mean we think like they're busts or they're bad. It right. just means right. that we'll like, say bust if we think they're a bust, which exactly you know, Anthony Richardson, Will Levis, those guys. <laughs> but there's not many busts that we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, these are just guys that shouldn't be drafted. Yeah, they probably should be drafted as highest. Exactly. Right. Exactly. All right, Mark. Uh, I think this is kind of your position. Say, yeah. uh, you know, cornerbacks. So let's, let's rock Corner. with it corner I, I did play defensive back back in my day was much better on the offensive side of the ball hence why I stopped playing defense played offense but i know a lot about this position because it's the opposing position i have to prepare for right so you know i've studied a lot of defensive backs in my times playing receiver and um you know I've, I've learned a lot about the position so we'll get into my corners here um i actually like joey porter as the best corner in the draft i like his length his athleticism I think he's a smart player. Um, 
very, very similar to Devin Witherspoon. And the only reason I have him ahead of Witherspoon is I just like his ball skills a little bit better. Uh, you, it's rare to see ball skills at the, at the corner or safety position. You see so many dropped interceptions. It drives me absolutely insane. Um, and he's one of those guys that rarely, if you give him a chance, is not going to make the play. And, you know, that can be that can change games. Turnovers absolutely change games. And if you have a guy that has a receiver's mindset playing corner, if the ball's thrown, it's mine. He's one of those guys. And there's not many like that. So I like him there for that reason. Witherspoon is my second guy. Um, I love the way this guy tackles. I love his mentality. He's physical. He's fearless. He's he's what you want in a corner. Honestly, he's comparable to like Jeff Okuda um, with a little more strength and, and um, muscle on him. You know what I mean? I, I think he can come up and tackle like Jeff Okuda started to do this year. I think you're going to see a physical guy from him. He's not going to be afraid of anybody in the league. Uh, my only question with him is just straight up coverage, right? Is he going to be able to stay in the man to man coverage and just be an right. absolute lockdown guy? I don't know if he is. So if you're going to take him that high, he better be. And I just, I don't know if he is. So I have then, similar uh, question marks on him. I yeah. will say that too. he'll tackle. I, no I'm, doubt I'm about it. Shit on whether you draft a corner a in the player. NFL, he better be able to run with Jamar chase, Justin right. Jefferson. Like, and if you can't, you shouldn't be drafted in the first round of the NFL um, as a corner. And then my third guy is Tomlinson out of TCU, nephew of Ladanian Tomlinson, obviously Hall of Fame player. Um, this guy's a freak of athlete, undersized, but absolute freak athlete can jump. I mean, I don't know if you saw that play in the college football playoff where he jumped out of nowhere to bat down a ball. I think it was intended for Roman Wilson. Just crazy, crazy athleticism um, all over the field. Very, very good in coverage. Very, he's like, He's so he's got like a knack for just being sneaky good when the ball's in the air. Like he he gets away with some sneaky stuff with his hands. Like he'll 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 use that hip pull. You know he might be beat by a step and he uses his speed and uses like a little hip pull to get that other hand out in front to bat the ball down. Another guy that has great ball skills. Um, clearly has an offensive background. I mean, running back clearly in his blood somewhere um, with his uncle. So I like the fact that he's um, being slapped on in this draft. I think he's worthy of probably a second round pick or a late first round pick. And he won't get drafted that high, but I like him a lot. My underrated player for very similar reasons as, as Tomlinson is Clark Phillips undersized, uh, very, very physical, smaller stature, but, but strong. And I think he's going to take players straight out. And I think I like Clark Phillips a lot out of Utah because he can play corner. You could probably move him into like, you know, a cam Sutton type of role as well on the inside. He'll guard slots and tight ends. He's not gigantic, but he will play bigger than he is. And I love that about him. He's got ball skills. And there's a common theme with my defensive back. I love guys that have ball skills. Right. I was a receiver. I cannot stand the defensive backs that can't catch. Right. You 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 have a chance to change the game and get a pick six or get a pick in a key moment and you drop it. Uh, you know, I just I hate it. I've seen too many games end where you think back, well, what if you would have just caught that layup that Matthew Stafford right. threw him? Instead, you dropped it and you're not you don't go to a Super Bowl. Right. Um my overrated guy is Ringo out of Georgia. Um, and I thought he was extremely overrated. I'll be honest with you. When the season ended, I started looking at his film, but then I kind of watched him do, go through his workouts. And then I went back and kind of rewatched some of his film. He moves very well for a guy, his size. And my worry is that he's going to be moved into safety. And if he's able to stay at corner at that size and, and survive in coverage, he's actually going to be very, very good. I just, he's just, to me, he's overrated, but again, same, you know, common theme, not by much. And I think that he doesn't need to be drafted as high as he's projected to, but very shortly after, I think he's a, he's a guy worth getting. Um, Maybe when you quite, draft him, you have safety in mind potentially. Yeah. Like he could, like he could that. probably play both dude, to be honest with yeah. you. And uh, he'd be a very, very good nickel guy and a guy you can blitz. He's got great hips. And I, I thought he was going to be a little more stiff than he was because of how strong he is. He's like, and he's like six two, like, 200 pounds like he's huge and uh you just That's don't see big corners. corner <laughs> yeah dude you're used to seeing like these long lengthy corners but he's got like i mean he's big you know so i like him i just think he's a little bit overrated sure um so my list is pretty similar uh to yours overall so obviously like D devin weathered spoon to me is the best corner in the class um i i don't think he's the type of guy that should be going you know Super high again. Like, I, I don't think he's a top 10 pick. I don't think any corner in this draft class is a top 10 pick, personally. Um, are any of them Sauce Gardner? Probably not. But he's a physical player. Um, I think that 
He's a smart player. I think he's incredibly fast. I, I have similar concerns about his ability to play man coverage. We'll see how that works out. Um, Christian Gonzalez, I think is a little safer in man coverage, but probably a little bit, you know, weaker than all of the other attributes that I just uh, credited uh, Witherspoon with having. Um, and then my third guy is Joey Porter. Uh, I have similar graces to say that, uh, that Mark did. I mean, his ball skills are nuts. He's, he's a, a phenomenal uh, corner all around. I don't have an overrated guy because I think me as an offensive lineman uh, have no business trying to tell corners what they are good and good at. Um, I just don't think mm. that's right. <laughs> um, and then my underrated guy is uh, Garrett Williams, who to me, like, and again, I'm an offensive lineman. Take my opinion for a grain of salt with a grain of salt. Uh, I think he plays really solid in man coverage. I think he has great feet. Uh, and I think that he's, you know, probably a guy that's going to fall a little bit, maybe second or third round guy, but it's still going to be like a lockdown man coverage corner. And man, looking at his tape too, he comes down with the freaking ball. Talk about ball skills. That dude knows how to inter intercept a ball. Like John, he, he I'm surprised, you, don't, I'm Sorry, surprised you haven't mentioned um, DJ Turner out of Michigan. He's, yeah. he's, you know, he's, he ran the fastest 40, right. For, um, for anyone at the combine. Uh, I obviously I hate getting into why that's not as important as people make it out to be, but he has filmed to back it, you know? Yeah. I think in general, I can't think of really any Michigan corners in the past few years, really, that have really panned out. I mean, the, the, you know, biggest stud guy in the defensive backfield that we've had has been Jarrell Peppers. And even then I would say his, his NFL career has yeah, been I, I pretty mean, average. So Jordan Lewis was like kind of with the Cowboys for a while. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's not a ton of, yeah, not to say that, that he doesn't have that kind of potential. He was a damn good player for us, but I don't know. I just, I, I've struggled to see Michigan, uh, you know, corners and safeties really make that, that next step, unless your name is, you know, Charles Woodson or something like that. So <laughs> <laughs> something like that. He was okay. <laughs> he was all right. right. <laughs> yeah. um, don't you so, have yeah. like his locker or something in like your dad's office or something? Yep. Like, so some cool my story. dad bought his locker at an auction and then brought him the plate um, to, he actually did a wine, he's a big wine guy and he did a wine tasting at the uh, ski resort that, uh, my family is a membership in in uh, Gaylord, Michigan. And so he brought him the plate and he said, Hey, like your, your old locker got auctioned off. I bought it. It's in my office. Would you mind signing this? And Woodson takes the pen and, and you know, takes the plate and he goes, can you give it back? <laughs> and so uh, I took a picture with all of us. He was, he was awesome. So uh, yeah, that was, that was a super memorable, uh, you know, time. Um, so, and obviously, you know, one of the greatest players to ever, yeah. to ever, you know, I mean, between him and Tom Brady, like, you know, I, I feel like a lower amount of Michigan guys do pan out the NFL level than I think, you know, maybe some of the other like, you know, top five, 10 colleges in the NCAA. But like the guys that we do have pan out are freaking studs. So, oh, yeah, um, you're the top of the top that come out of Michigan are, well, pretty damn good, dude. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I mean Tom Brady, Charles Woodson. That you could make an argument for Dude, that's best it. defensive that's all player <laughs> and best, best quarterback offensive. of all time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, all right, and then safeties. Which uh, look, I'll say this is probably like the position that I was like, kind of like, who do I pick here? Um, Mark, do, well, do you want to go a... first, or you want me to take it? Um, yeah, I, I'll I'll take it. I mean, it's not very deep. There's not a very deep right. safety class. Um, I have a couple guys out of Alabama and really the only reason I have them is because I trust Nick Saban to get those guys prepared. And there's been a history of Alabama safeties and corners that come out and play very well. So I have Brian branch and Jordan battle. Um, Brian branch is probably put a little bit higher than battle is, but I think both these guys are good players. I think that they will be good NFL players. I just don't think they're worthy of like crazy high drafting, you know, uh, Nick Saban will get these guys ready to play and they will definitely be, ready for NFL uh, competition, but you know, and then I have Sidney Johnson as my third guy, again, not like incredibly impressed with the safeties in this draft class. My underrated guy is Brandon Hill. Um, there's some upside with some of these guys, but again, like the, the common theme here is I think these guys will be fine, but you're not going to see any game changing Tyron Matthew, Ed Reed, like ball Hawks, crazy tackling safeties that come out of this draft. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think the the one guy that's maybe a, a first round pick overall is Brian Branch. I think that he's probably, you know, going to be uh, probably the only safety selected in the first round. I think the rest of these guys, I also have Jordan Battle in here. So there's that. He's my number three guy in the middle of Sidney Brown, who is Illinois uh, safety. Look, I see what Kirby Joseph has developed into, and that's kind of what I see in uh, in Sydney Brown. I think they are pretty similar prospects overall. Um, I would say probably Joseph had slightly better ball skills um, in college, but still, I, I think I, I I don't have the number in front of me, but I think he uh, he did just fine. Yeah, it's six interceptions on the season, so you yeah. know. Not I bad said Sydney Johnson. By the way, I meant Sydney Brown. I think I, I was looking at I was looking at two different guys. Oh, good. I think I mixed up their names, but yeah, Sydney Brown uh, would, from from Illinois. You know his his brother um, is a running back prospect. Oh, really? Illinois. Yeah, his twin brothers. So they, you know, you. both had really good careers. I, I can see I can see the frame I, on on Sydney Brown and just assume that his his brother having a similar. They frame both is, tested really well too at the combine yeah. and stuff like. Um, you know, so we have the same, like, the same three, we have the same three safeties. out of order. Yeah. Okay. But I have, yeah. I have Brown third and, um, behind branch and battle, but the, cause I think he has the most upside potential of the mm-hmm. three. I just think the safer picks would be branch and battle, you know, cause Alabama, Illinois, you know, right. Yeah. Safety position is a lot about preparation and, you know, you have to be really, really smart to play the safety pr- position in the NFL. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's very underrated and how hard that position is to play and you have to be an absolute fearless dude so a lot goes into it that's that's super fair um and then my underrated guy is uh jair brown who i just feel like nobody's talking about this guy and again i know it's not a super deep safety class so maybe that's why he has 10 interceptions on the season at and he's a penn state guy right he's he's playing behind joey porter um i mean I, I don't know. Ball hawk, dude. He had, he had ten thing. picks it's a, it's a over two seasons. Ball hawk. Yeah. Ten picks, like that's a lot. So that's why I'm like, hey, like if you're trying to grab a safety, and he's probably gonna fall to you know third round, fourth round. I mean, this he's is a good, the he's a good player. Yeah, he's a good player, and it's it, like to me, all, like if you're looking for a guy to like take a risk on, right? Go with the guys that have a shit ton of career interceptions. We did that with Kirby Joseph. I think it worked out for us personally. I think that we're, you know, we're probably not going to sign Tracy Walker when his contract, you know, is is up because we feel good about Joseph. I we probably rather sign, you know, Gardner Johnson or something like that. So it's a, uh, I don't know. I just feel like to me, it's a no brainer if you're trying to get these day two, day three guys. Grab the guys that are ball hawks just makes sense. So that's, that's my opinion on it. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's things that I'm missing, but I digress. Overall, I do think it's probably a better defensive draft um, class than offensive. You know, our last episode, we did our offensive prospects. If you haven't checked that out, it's worth checking out. Um, But I do think that the top of the top talent, there's more top of the top line guys on offense than there are on defense. But I do think there's, a deeper side to the defensive side of the ball. And I think most teams, if you are, um, you know, I'm just looking at the general consensus of the NFL right now. Most teams, if you're, if you need a quarterback, that's probably your number one priority. There's not many teams that are in that situation. And then probably, you know, defense, a lot of these defenses struggled last year. There's not many great defenses in the league last year. And I think that that's, you're going to see defensive guys getting taken off the board rather quickly once the quarterbacks are gone. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, you know, to me, that actually has me fired up, not only as a Lions fan, but just an NFL fan. I think that, like, I think there's going to be a lot of defense taken very high, and I don't think uh, a lot of these guys have a crazy amount of question marks around them. Again, some of them are different athletes. They can do some things better than others. Um, so it's about fit at the end of the day, rather than, like, are these guys going to pan out? It's like, hey, you know, if you're, if you're drafting Witherspoon to play man, there might be question marks around there. If you're drafting Witherspoon to freaking be an amazing tackler and have, you know, great vision and ball skills, that's probably your guy. So, you know, just situations like that. Um, we're two weeks away, man. I can't be more stoked about it. Uh, my dad's Love actually draft, flying man. in from Michigan uh, to come watch uh, uh, the Thursday draft night with me. So it should be a good time. Um yeah, can't wait for it. Uh, and we're we'll going to do a live do, stream. We'll try to uh, do something too. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, I mean, and look, uh, no better time than to ideate with you than being on the actual podcast. But uh, 
I'm thinking, you know, live stream before the actual draft to do like a mock draft with our buddies. And then maybe we do a live stream on day three too, just kind of while the, the picks are rolling and we can hang out, kind of react to some stuff. I'll, and that. I'll probably do something. John will be, will be busy uh, hanging with his pops, but I'll, I'll probably do something as well during the draft, the first round, um, whether that's Instagram live or TikTok live or whatever it is, I'll do something and um, you know, we'll be, sure to share that out there too but I, I would love to kind of talk about prospects as they get taken off the board and see who kind of falls and who gets picked earlier than expected it, it's always interesting and it's always cool seeing these guys dreams come true and watching that right and seeing these teams kind of invest in their future um because there's a lot of strategy a lot of prep that goes into it and teams either get better or get worse there is no staying the same and if you pick the wrong guy you can really set yourself back so you pick the right guy, you can change your – just ask the Kansas City Chiefs when they moved up to pick Mahomes, <laughs> how that, you know, has changed that team. So, right. um, you know, uh, just a fun fact before we sign off here, um, Sean Payton actually was absolutely in love with Mahomes and was expecting to grab yeah, him. I, um, and then a, KC moved ahead of him. <laughs> moved I ahead think of the him, Saints maybe. had the next pick too. Yeah, yeah. It was like, it was like one or two like picks the, away. Like, yeah. like the Chiefs moved up one pick ahead of new Orleans and new Orleans was going to take Mahomes. Right. Exactly. So almost as if Andy a... Reid knew if I let this guy fall one more, pick, <laughs> right. Sean, Sean Payton's Sean's going to get him. Yeah. Cause there's not many guys that recognize quarterback talent like that, you know, um, without the success, like Mahomes wasn't crazy successful in college. He didn't win a ton of games, right. He was kind of middle of the pack, but his, play was there you know the potential was there then like he's one of those guys where they saw him and it was you know kind of like how zach wilson and anthony richardson are are impressing right now but it was one of those times where it was for the right reasons you know right yeah i mean and hey evaluating a quarterback is seems to be the one thing that nobody has truly figured out yet in the nfl oh and let's Um, be honest too how important having the right coach is too like if zach wilson were drafted by the kansas city city chiefs yep he would probably be a very good quarterback i can't see richardson gets picked by the broncos like i mean i might have to take back my bus predictions because i i really i cannot stress that entire thing enough is that quarterback is so contingent on the program you're in the weapons you're surrounded by the coaches that you have 100 percent. it it really can make or break your success and a lot of quarterbacks ended up being busts could have had very different careers uh if they landed with a different team and vice versa so yeah worth noting for sure well uh we appreciate everybody for tuning in uh i think we're gonna have a, a solid guest for next week and then obviously it's draft week after that so some exciting times here on the podcast we appreciate everybody tuning in and bearing with the technical difficulties for this one i think yeah i think sorry I was about pretty that graceful. my my internet's not the best um Happens to the best of us. No worries at all. We will catch you guys next time. Peace. Love you guys.